show. This is fitness and nutrition expert Sean Stevenson here with my beautiful and talented co-host and producer Jade Harrell. What's up, Jade? What's up, Sean? How are you doing today? I am dynamic recuperating. Dynamic recuperating. Yes, I'm dynamic because I'm recuperating. Oh yes, yes, getting you over do. that mess. Yes, yes, you got attacked by the summer sickness. Big time. The grossness. It slapped me down like smackdown. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that you're recovering. You look Thank beautiful you. and Thank your you. energy is so much higher today. I'm very, very excited much and thanks. excited to be able to share this with you guys, her energy, my energy, and also our special guest. Wow. Very, very special guest. I've been excited about having her on for quite some time. Her book is just, let me find the right word for it. <laughs> it's, it's critical. Mm. It's critical. It's crucial in our world today. Uh, really getting back in touch with what matters most and what's real about us, what's most natural about us. And it's really about movement. You know, life is movement. It is. It's really the definition. And when we cease to move, what is the, you know, when we think of somebody who's gone, it's yeah. like there's no movement anymore. It's still. You mm -hmm. know, so her book is actually called Move Your DNA. Mm -hmm. And I'm just infatuated with this book. Like, mm -hmm. I literally, and I rarely do this, but. I read, a, I read a couple of chapters and I go back and I read it again because usually I just assimilate, right. you know, I'll maybe take a couple of notes, but it's just like, I don't know. It's just like, it washes over me and just like, aha. It's penetrating yes. you down to your DNA. It makes sense. Yes. So to your core. <laughs> so we're going to bring her on in just a moment. But first, let's give a huge shout out to our show sponsor, onit.com. Head over to onnit.com forward slash model for 10% off all of your health and human performance supplements. You should know by now we're huge fans of the hemp force protein. Yes, the most indeed. bioavailable protein structure for the human body mm -hmm. is going to be found in hemp. Funny enough. Right. Edestin and also albumin, which is a soft globular protein. I like saying globular. I like saying globular. Right. It reminds me of Ghostbusters for some <laughs> reason. Slimer, globular. Right, right. I wonder if it's color. But these are very digestible proteins. And in particular, people go to egg whites to get the the albumin, right? Because it's very, very digestible. But let's be for real. Egg whites are kind of gross. Well, let's be serious yeah. about it. I'm just being honest. It's a tough guy. So now, here's the thing. Number one, the edestin and the albumin, but also the essential fatty acid structure. They actually put some whole hemp seeds in there as well. Pretty good ratio for the human body. It's about three to one, omega-6 to omega-3 respectively, which is ideal. Okay. for us you know and omega-6 is the pro-inflammatory and omega-3s are the anti-inflammatory it's not that either one is bad it's just when it gets out of balance mm -hmm. you know in our world today we're definitely eating a pro-inflammatory diet if we're on the standard american kind of paradigm yeah. which is for some some foods like some animal tissues that we can eat from factory farmed cows for example the, the tissues could be upwards of say 21 to 1 wow. or even higher right which can be creating Inflammation in your body, which basically means internal fire. Yes. Right? You're hot inside. Yes, blow it up. And don't know why. <laughs> and that's going to lead to other problems for you. It could be what your genetic disposition is, uh, predisposition, which could be, you know, uh, arthritis. Mm -hmm. could be heart issues. It could be uh, issues with your joints. You know, inflammation is a catalyst for a lot of problems. So we can avoid that by getting higher quality food. And Hemp Force is definitely my protein of choice for a protein supplement. Also check out the Shroom Tech, Shroom Tech Sport, and Shroom Tech Immune. Immune. It's some good Thank stuff as well. Thank God for that. But just head over there, check them out. They got so many good things. Onit.com forward slash model for 10% off. Now let's get into the iTunes review of the week. Yes, this is a great one from Trackstar829. Five stars on this one. Addictive, entertaining, and oh, so educational. Can I get a six star iTunes? Because this show deserves it. My podcast app is actually yelling at me for neglecting my other podcasts to listen to this one. Sorry, Dave Asprey. <laughs> My husband and I are both in the military, and since he is currently deployed, I find I have a lot of soul-searching time on my hands. Listening to this dynamic duo has helped me to step back and develop a new perspective on life and health. They also join me at home, keeping me laughing and learning every day. From my inner bath in the morning to spending some time working out in my inner gym with these two have changed me in a more confident, peaceful, and productive person inside and out. They introduced me to Onnit, and I love the Hemp Force Protein, but I blame Sean for the Super Green Supplement being sold out, shaking my fist. In a job that focuses on outer toughness, I am blessed to have Sean strengthening my inner toughness and acceptance. 
Everyone needs to listen to this podcast because we all could use a little model health in our lives. I received the message you're putting out, Sean. Wonderful, man. That is so beautiful. Totally Thank you. Yes. Totally get it. You're in. You're in the inner Every circle. Level. You remember the movie Meet the Parents? We Loved talked about it. the inner circle, yeah. right? You're in the inner circle. And he's like, you, right. fucker, you're out of the circle. Right. <laughs> but you're in the inner circle for sure. Thank that you so much so for good. leaving that review. And everybody, thanks so much for leaving those reviews on iTunes. It means the world to us. It does. Now let's get into our special guest. Very, very special guest, Katie Bowman. This is the first time I'm reading a bio from the book because I've literally been carrying this book around with me everywhere I go when I've been traveling. And I, I'm like I said, I'm going, going back and it's just changing my paradigm the way that I look at things. So I just, we're just going to read a little quick segment from it. Mm-hmm. Katie Bauman has earned an international reputation for educating the general population on alignment and load science, and as a result, has helped thousands to reduce pain, increase bone density, improve metabolic health, and solve their pelvic floor mysteries. She is known for her radical counterculture health directives based on the hard science that she has made her life's work. A biomechanist by training and a problem solver at heart, Katie has the ability to blend a scientific approach with straight talk about sensible solutions and an unwavering sense of humor. Yes, yeah, she's kind of funny. A little right, funny. Right, right. Earning her legions of followers. Her blog, katiesays.com, reaches hundreds of thousands of people every month, and thousands have taken her live classes. And this book is just, it's a paramount work. It's, it's, it's definitely mm-hmm. one of the things that I highly, highly recommend if you are dedicated to improving your health and well-being. Definitely check out Move Your DNA. And I'd like to welcome to the Model Health Show, Miss Katie Bowman. Hi. How you doing, Katie? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. You look fantastic. I'm outside. Yes. And for everybody, if you want to see the video, so you can see Katie in her setup that has me peanut butter and jealous. <laughs> I am peanut butter and jealous. She's actually outside under an apple tree. Mm, eating apples. Whole, eating apples. Right. 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 You can go to the modelhealthshow.com. You can check out the video. But Katie, this is all about you. And I want to know, just to give everybody some context about a, what is a biomechanist? You know, this is a term <laughs> that's probably pretty new to a lot of people. Um, well, biomechanics is a field of study where you're looking at uh, forces, physical forces, and how they impact the function of biological things. I look at um, tissues, cells, humans, there are animal biomechanists, trees, you can study the biomechanics of trees. So it's just really, um, I think that uh, science has become kind of segmented, right? So you might look at the body from a chemical perspective. Right. If you're a biochemist, a biomechanist would consider forces always. You're always thinking about, oh, that, I can see how something's working, but what forces are driving that as opposed mm-hmm. to pulling the forces out and looking at it without the forces. So that's what I do. Interesting. Very interesting stuff. And this leads me to asking you, what brought you into this field right. of study? Well, oh. first of all, I mean, what got you interested in this kind of health and, and that whole field in the first place? Um, goodness. I think that I, I, I was a very sedentary child. I've always been kind of a book, bookwormy mm-hmm. type of person. Um, but about age 15, I started um, swimming competitively and then I started doing a little bit more sports and I started to, and I started to walk. I think, I think I probably just didn't have a car. <laughs> so I needed to, to walk to school. You know, you don't want to take the yeah. bus. So I started walking a few miles and then I just, I just found so much, um, found so much joy or my body felt feeling a certain way where I was no longer having to choose to move. I couldn't, I couldn't not move. So I just started to move a lot more and I was always a, like a math and physics geek kind of. And so I went to college to be a mathematician and then I switched to being a a physicist in college. But I, at this point I was really starting to move and and run. Like I was someone who hated the mile day Mm, in elementary school, like hated it. Like I just, I wasn't good at it. Um, I come from a very sedentary family. Um, but I, I around 18 and 19, you know, now I'm in, in, um, college and, and then I, I just found that physics was kind of boring because all the problems were just boring and theoretical. And so I was looking through the college catalog trying to figure out what I could take all those units that I had already taken and apply them to. And there was this little program, biomechanics, where it was math and physics applied to anatomy and physiology. Mm. And it came through the kinesiology department. So there was all these movement requirements. I was like, perfect. It it married my love of um, the physical sciences 
with my love for movement and I could get credit for, for moving and studying movement. And that was, I think that's how I started um, my path to biomechanics. Interesting. Very interesting. Very. So this really, you know, we hear this story consistently. And I know with you talking with so many people in our field, it's kind of born out, our, out of our own problems mm -hmm. that we kind of sure. seek solutions to this stuff. But you're doing this at such a high level. I mean, what, what helped you to make the transition from studying this in school to actually teaching people about it? What was the catalyst there? Oh, money? I don't know. It was like my job. <laughs> right? so, I, so I started teaching exercise. Exercise, like I was a, a personal trainer mm -hmm. and an aerobics it. instructor in the 90s because it was a great way to make, there was no other way at that time to make 30 bucks an hour. It was like $30 an hour. Mm, You're going to pay right. me to go exercise and mm -hmm. teach others. So I, I found that I was just really good at teaching movement and I won, you know, the Bally's uh, aerobics instructor of the year award. Mm. Really? You know, yeah, yeah. Cause, and and like step aerobics, like stuff that, that I don't do anymore. But I just, I, K I like Katie, I feel like I'm getting closer <laughs> to you right now. Like that's, yeah. I didn't know that about you. That yeah. is like, I would have never in a million years guessed that. Yeah. So that was, and I and I would teach anything, right? I was like, sure, I'll teach. I never taught. I'll do that. And 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 then um, I started working when I graduated with my bachelor's degree in personal training. Yeah. Um, but I would get all the people who really needed someone who had more than just a, a certification, who needed a little bit more training with how to modify. And then um, after that, I started just recognizing, wow, like the last 30 people that I worked with who had had this injury really had the same body shape or really had these same movement problems. And then I started going, oh, yeah, that makes sense because mechanically, um, if you have a failure here, it's always going to load your lumbar disc mm, you know so right, I, right. I just and then i thought you know what people should really know ahead of time the things that they're going to be prone to have because of the shape of their body which we call anthropometric dimensions or their habits which are like sitting or running or whatever it was that they were doing there was a very logical tissue breakdown that a biomechanist would be able to figure out like in the same way that an engineer could look at a building and go hey, it's going to fail right there yeah because you could just do it so i went back to graduate school and studied um movement cultural movements so all cultures have slightly different yeah. ways of moving uh, then the injuries that arise um, within those populations and um, from a mechanical perspective and then over the last 10 years since my graduate degree really studying um, continuing on with mechanotransduction and looking at movement on a cellular level as opposed to looking at it as a whole body phenomenon and that's I think that's where I got to my approach, you know, that the, the approach that's in move your DNA is like trying to break down like movement versus exercise, movement of a body versus movement of parts of a body. And it all stems from that really that whole thing, that whole process of me going from a, of a kind of a sloppy mover mm -hmm. to a mover working with people like fine tuning movement and then looking at movement on, on a, on as small of a possible level as you can, I guess, without going into quantum physics you know looking at just how does the bend of a cell affect the the outcome or the behavior of that cell right. and that's kind of my journey well let's actually talk a little bit about that because um having this very distinct and i, I really got it when reading your book about uh this distinction between movement and exercise right and you talk about the yeah. fact that and i've been using this term all over the place i'm going to get it on t-shirt <laughs> nutritious <laughs> movement right yeah. nutritious movement we need not just nutritious food, not just nutritious uh, relationships, but you can apply that terminology to anything, but That's nutritious right. movement and movement being different from exercise. Can you talk about that distinction? Oh, gosh, it's a big one. Yeah. Um, you know, exercise, in the book, I just kind of, it's easiest to give examples of things that are movement that you wouldn't consider exercise that still affect um, the way your body is shaped. Like clearly if you go out and you work out, you're going to be like, oh, there's going to be a shape that my body's going to get, right? That's why you practice form and you make sure that your exercises are real balanced so that you get this end shape that you want to mm -hmm. your body, whether it's, you know, cut abs or like bulging biceps or whatever it is. Right. Like you're, you're going after a shape. You really are. Right. Um, but your environment is moving you. There's all these other things like, you know, how, how do the muscles in between the bones of your foot move when you're walking versus when you're in a shoe and when you're not. So that shoe kind of stops um, the movement of your foot. So although you are exercising, 
there are parts of you that are not, right? right? So exercise then is not this global movement thing that we think of it. Or if I look at the computer screen, like I'm looking at the computer screen right now, and in order to see you, my eyeballs do some, like the muscles in my eyes will right. change the shape of a lens, right? So then if we stare at screens all the time, there's a, there's a shape to my lens that gets set and it's going to affect whether or not I need glasses. Right. So there's movements that are happening because of the way that you live your life that are outside of this one hour that you do um, called exercise, you're moving 100% of the time, but you're only exercising when you're you know, making the decision to go out and exercise. So you have a shape, everyone has a shape to their body and a shape to all of the parts of their body that are brought about by how they have moved, yeah. not only how they have exercised. So we're just, we're playing with, we're trying to optimize what we do for this one hour a day. Yes. So you move like you're just right. You have this graph and I, I put an accelerometer on you and all your parts and I'm trying to plot how much you move. And it's like still, 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 still exercise, Boom, still, yeah. still, still. And we're like spending all this money and like reading books on what to do for this one hour to get the best version of ourselves. So right. move your DNA was like, because you're adapting to what you do 100% of the time, how about playing with the other 23 hours yeah. around your exercise time to get a different shape? Oh, to your body. That is beautiful. Gorgeous. That is beautiful. And, you know, Sean, you speak about muscle fibers and all the specific fibers. We're talking down to the cellular level, but even so, what's so exciting to me is talking about this cultural piece. Now, there are many cultures, and we talk about, you said, nutritious uh, exercise. Well, there are many cultures in the United States, perhaps, even that are nutrient deficient because of food deserts. I wonder if culturally... They are also movement deficient and exercise deficient. Maybe what things can they do in their daily lives if those things aren't re readily available? Well, so nutritious movement is is our new is our new branding because it's based on this idea that in the same way you eat food, <clears throat> you know, you eat you eat a piece of food, and within that piece of food has many micro it ha it contains both micro and macronutrients the food itself but the compounds that we've reduced food to the vitamins and minerals you can take them in supplement form you know you can go to the store and take vitamin c and you can buy fiber you can buy like seven different jars that reflect what this one apple you know right. this one apple right here underneath my tree has been reduced to yeah. so we study it that way and then we're like okay these are these are essential nutrients but when you take them in What's, what's essential to those nutrients are the result that the, the resultant behavior of the cells, right? It's not the, it's only nutritious if you put it in your mouth, right? To have it is not nutritious. It's the interaction. Right. So movement in that same way creates a cellular deformation. Your cells are being moved and squished and twisted. They're being deformed, but every single one of those unique cellular deformations brings about a different behavior. So in that same way, movements are inputs, like like uh, chemical compounds are mm -hmm. inputs right. because the net result is the same. It's a, the cell behaves a particular way right. in the, in the um, presence of, or not in the presence of whatever inputs you're putting in. So, so there are like macronutrients we have macronutrient deficiencies. And so macronutrient deficiency, like macronutrients would be like fat, protein, um, carbohydrates. They're like these big categories of things. So I think like walking, walking is a movement, but it contains many smaller micronutrients mm -hmm. within it. Right. So people will be like, oh, I walk, you know, I go for a walk and I walk, you know, between here and there. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Humans have been walking like five to 10 miles a day, every single day of their life. Walking is kind of like the equivalent to fat. And so there's people who've been fat free for a long time, yeah. right? And then they had a particular health outcome and then you're like, you gotta eat fat. And then, and then they start eating a ton of fat. Like fat is a main part of a diet. If you're looking at the percentages, it's a main part of your um, caloric intake. Right. Walking is too, so we are, in the same way that we were like fat free, we're walking free. Right. And so people, that's a huge category that you could just start supplementing with by, by walking more. Um, and then as far as the micronutrients go, because you've been wearing shoes and you've been sitting in chairs and 
wearing belts and staring at computer screens and all these things that we've done, when you go to go do the thing, like walking, you're not really using all of your parts because they've adapted to the geometry of those other things. So adaptation is the addition or the elimination of parts of your body. Right. That's what it is. You're, mm -hmm. you're changing your structure in some way. You're producing something. You're not producing something. But you are physically more or less when you have adapted throughout your body. So, for example, almost everyone has a positive heel on their shoe. Like if you go to your closet and pull out all of your shoes, you'll see that they have a heel. Not just women's high heels, but mm -hmm. men's athletic trainers, kids' shoes. Everyone's got a heel. So it limits by proxy the full range of motion of your ankle. So then your body starts getting rid of those parts that would allow for the full range of motion of the ankle because there's, it's not going to maintain them because you're not using them. So then you're like, hey, Katie, this is awesome. I want to go supplement with walking. Mm -hmm. But your walk that you do isn't as nutritious as had you had all of your parts. So you have to kind of, we use the micronutrients. The micronutrients are essentially those corrective exercises, right? Yeah. Mobilizing and you're trying to slowly transition your body to have a greater range of motion, more muscle mass to stabilize those motions. And so that's like the micronutrients, but eventually the micronutrients should facilitate more macronutrients like walking, squatting. Squatting is a motion, a, a large category of motion, sitting and getting up and down off of the ground, carrying stuff, right? Instead of putting it in backpacks and purses or in your car or in your house, like you'd have to walk around using your arms for more than texting or being on a computer. So there's all of these large categories of, of movements that humans are missing now. So that's kind of how I associate it with nutrition and the idea that there are a huge range of nutrients that you need, but I can't just tell you to eat more fat, eat more carbohydrates. I have to dial it in a little bit more because right. you could go get fat and carbohydrate in a non-helpful way. Right. So then it's like, well, it turns out that there's these certain chains of fats that you need. And it's the same way. You can't really do all your walking on a treadmill or in shoes or on flattened level ground because all of those are kind of processed. They're like junk, junk moving. There so you it's go. It's like the equivalent to junk food. Yeah. So that natural terrain and all of those there are lots of pieces to walking that walking is not just, it's a category of movement. You have to dial right. it in a little bit more. So that's yeah. how we work with nut nutrition as far as movement goes. These are some of the things that kind of opened my paradigm to just looking at, wow, you know, we think we're doing this one thing that's helping something, but we're actually, there's so much more to the picture, you know, yeah. like when we're going for a walk and we're wearing our fancy, like, do you remember people used to wear Skechers? Like, I mean, not like Skechers have gotten better, but I mean, like the Skechers with this really fat, just like s swole up, like packet of sausage under your shoe, right? And people were using those and they were like called shapers or something like that. And doing, we're doing our walking like that, not understanding all of the biomechanical changes that are happening. And what's really interesting, and I want you to talk more about this as well, is that every movement or every non-movement that we're engaged in is impacting our cellular makeup you know like just like if every bite of food that you eat impacts every cell in your body you know and just like even uh let's talk a little bit about sitting for example yeah. when you're sitting there are certain muscles that are hypertonic like they're tur they're turned on in a big way and there's certain muscles that are in, in essence shut off for efficiency you know it's like and you become adapted like your body becomes very good at sitting you know, and then um, so one of the things I saw in your book is that chart is just like, yes, when somebody you, you, you had the picture of somebody sitting down and then we think that when we stand up that we're just we're, we're unstraightening, you know, we're, I'm sorry, we're straightening ourselves out <laughs> from that sitting position, but it's not so you're actually let's talk. Actually, you, you talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I think the nutrition, the nutrition piece helps because like you said, you're adapting to every single thing you're putting into your mouth, not just the good choices, right? right. It's not like, I'm just going to adapt to that salad. I'm not going to worry about that creme brulee. I'll just not adapt to that. Mm. But yet we have this idea that we could sit and be sedentary for 11 to 12 hours a day, but exercise off our sedentaryism. Like, right? Yeah. Like, that's the idea. Yeah. It's like, I've been sitting a lot, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go move, right? Like that it counterbalances that the one hour of input of movement is going to balance the 11 hours of static positioning. That would be like 
eating 11 hours worth of Snickers and then eating a salad to try to, to offset <laughs> your adaptation. You adapt to what you do 100% of the time, not right. to the good stuff. You adapt to all of it. So, so this has been a big deal in movement research because people were put into two categories. You were active because you're an exerciser, which I'm sure most of the people listening to the show kind of go, oh, I got to exercise every day. They got that. And then there's the sedentary, couch potatoes, don't exercise. But when you plot those two people next to each other on a graph, their only, like, their only difference is about 4% of the day, meaning the health benefits to that hour of movement that you're getting is is very small. It's significant because yeah. the difference between being a non-mover and being an exerciser are huge. Right. But the difference between being an exerciser and a mover are going to be much larger than the difference between being an exerciser and sedentary. Because you're talking, you're playing with 10 or 12 extra hours now. Right. You're not looking at the difference of behavior in one hour. So it's like everyone gets up in the morning and they go go to school or get their family ready. They eat, you know, they go, they, maybe they work out in the morning, maybe they work out in the evening. But other than that, it's the same, you're doing the same chores. We're all in the same culture, right? You're, you're, mm -hmm. you're getting in your car, you're driving somewhere, probably close. <laughs> you, know, you, <laughs> yeah. you, you then sit, you work on the computer for a long period of time. There's just a, you know, a percentage of us that exercise, but that's what all the sitting, sitting research was about. It's like, it doesn't matter if you're an exerciser, you are a set, you're a sedentary person. Right. So there's this new category within research called actively sedentary, which means you're sedentary 96% mm. of your life, you exercise 4%. So they, so now there's this kind of trying to go, okay, now what's the difference when someone is moving and breaking up their bits of sedentarism? Yeah. Because the, the, the deaths from all mortalities are really the same. Like you're still seeing athletes super athletes getting the same knee replacements hip replacements torn acls like they're at the doctor just as much they're on the same medications the same frequency of medication they're still struggling with their health they're fitter they tend to look like fit people compared to couch potatoes but it's not really transferring over to like a huge health reward or as, as not as much as it as it could so i just think that people would be excited to know that like, there's 11 hours of stuff of just changing how you do your life a little bit, you know, like sitting and doing your podcast outside as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, or whatever, changing up how you sit in front of your desk. Yeah. That could bring about significant health rewards. So that's, you know, that's yeah, essentially very what exciting. I'm trying to talk we're, about. Very exciting. We're going to talk more about some of the solutions for sure, but I really want to just hammer in one of these foundational ideas. Another big thing that I took away and I'm usually not like this big of a fanboy, right? <laughs> but this is so important, you know, and just the concept of loads, you know, yeah. and how all these different things in our environment are placing certain loads or taking off a certain amount of pressure from every single cell in our body. So can you talk a little bit about this whole idea that you really, uh, re I mean, especially in the first part of the book that you really helped to lay out and lay the foundation because everything yeah. else, after I got that, everything else made complete sense. So talk a little bit about loads. Well, loads. So I, I, I felt the need to clarify loads. I mean, it's kind of technical. I tried to make it as simple as possible. But loads are the, the deformation of your cell. It's, it's how your cell experiences the forces that you're creating through movement and through interacting with your environment. So... We're just so like we would say walking, like if we we're going to compare a bunch of people going for a walk, we could say that they're all doing the same thing. But when you start adding shoes to certain people or changing the rate at which they walk or the terrain over which they're walking or even the frequency with which they walk, it changes the load. It changes the way that the, the cells are deformed. And so loads have lots of variables. So I, I think the easiest way to kind of explain is like if you take a couch and you put it on your carpet in your living room. Mm -hmm. Like say you're moving your furniture around and you put it down. And then like 15 minutes later, you're like, oh, I don't like where it is. You'll move the couch and you'll look and there'll be like a footprint, right? Where your couch was, where the carpet's been compressed a mm -hmm. little bit. Right. The, the carpet experienced a particular load. There's a particular deformation. But if you take that exact same couch and that exact same carpet and leave it in that exact same position for a month, when you pull it away, there's a difference in the behavior of the carpet. It doesn't spring back up slowly. Right. So, so with movement, 
we're kind of at with movement now where we were with nutrition like 60 years ago where it was just like these big categories like oh you, you need to need good calories you need to make sure you're getting fat protein and carbohydrate like these real general blanket things and it's like oh no no you need all these things and all of a sudden your nutrient list gets longer i mean you're talking about the difference in different in the intro you were talking about like the difference between omega-3s and omega-6s like that's huge compared to say someone needs fat right like right. you've dialed yeah. it in people have dialed it in yet on movement we're still like just move more you know, like just eat more, you're feeling bad, just eat more, you know? And it's like, no, it's, it's not, I mean, yes, but there's, we need to get down to the omega sixes and the omega three equivalent to mm -hmm. movement. And that's what loads give us. Loads yeah. give us the ability to talk about when you walk with your pronation in your ankle, that's this load. That load actually isn't that helpful to you. Yeah. Not that it's not helpful across the board, but to you, you don't need that nutrient. You are overdosing in that nutrient. What you need is to use your ankle in this position. And mm. that's, that's what loads are. Loads are nutrients. And there are an infinite, an infinite number of loads that can be really, really be created. And then we talk about exercise. It's real easy to go, oh, right, I'm going to change my form. I'm going to cross train. But I'm talking about the frequency with which you spend sitting, looking at a computer screen, the terrain that you walk over, how much you walk, how you walk. Do you have your parents, you've inherited your gait pattern from your parents, kind of the same way that you inherited all the complex tongue and lip actions that make your accent, right? That's not, it's hereditary in the sense of you were, ex you were exposed to it at such an early age, it shaped you, it shaped how you talk. And then therefore how you talk shapes the face bone structure in the same way of exercising or not changes the shape of your hip bone, the robusticity of the bone. So that's, we've kind of gotten into this easy way of going, that's just genetic. You know, your, mm, your right. knee drop, you, your dad has it, your grandpa has it. So you could just expect that instead of really understanding, like, no, it's passed on through example, but we are pattern recognition machines. You come out as an infant and you're just, you're just memorizing all the patterns that you see, talking, movement, everything, and those get established. And then your body shape resembles this cultural inheritance, not, not only a genetic inheritance, but a, a cultural inheritance. And then you get the shape. So we, there's definitely things about the culture, um, you know, being inside versus outside shoes. I mean, so many things that we could talk about, mm -hmm. but all of those things are affecting the loads because you're not only moving through your environment, your environment is moving you. Mm. Now that sounds that, like the equivalent of you saying it's not what you eat. It's what you eat ate. It's not how you move. Yeah. It's how you move in and around the things. Your that environment are is you. moving. You. Yes. That's so powerful. That, that speaks to also the example when you talk about the orcas. Yeah. Right. And can you just give like a really quick snapshot? <laughs> because that really demonstrates how loads really do shape your behavior yeah. and your and your structure. Yeah. And also the difference, I think, between, hey, in Orca, SeaWorld is just swimming. Swimming's natural. It's in water. It's its natural environment. Like if you if you reduce an Orca's environment down to a substance, water, and then you try to justify keeping an Orca in a tank by saying that it's its natural saltwater mm -hmm. environment, you are missing that the environment is more than the medium, that the environment is also the loads created by moving through it, by how you move through it. So an orca in the wild is swimming in a way that maintains the height of its dorsal fin. So the dorsal fin in all orcas, as you go through puberty, gets very soft and supple. But it's also punctu that that period of time lines up naturally with the most vigorous swimming that you're going to have. So the growth spurt is happening at a time where the forces created by moving support the structure. There is no scaffolding. There's no visible scaffolding. Forces are invisible. The scaffolding are the forces that are created by how you move through through your medium, through your habitat. So when you change an orca's habitat, especially the male orcas who have a very tall fin, and you put them into the same medium, salt water, but you change the shape of the medium, right? It's in a tank. So now the orca can't go fast. It can't go straight. It's got to go in a circle. Right. You then begin to see just how important the role of forces, the roles of forces are because when you've removed that invisible scaffolding, you see a collapse of the orca fin. So if no one knows what we're talking about visually, you can go Google 
SeaWorld, Tillicum, whatever, and you'll see the folded flop, Free Willy, right? You could even right. do the Free Willy movie, and you'll see this. You'll free see the Willy, flop Free structure. Willy. Not That's that right. one. Not that <laughs> Oh, not, no, not, no, no, okay. Mm -mm, no, by far. Um, <laughs> I just, an apple just fell out. I'm just worried. The apple, when apple falls <laughs> in my head, you have to keep that in. Just conk. Of course, of course. Mm -hmm. The environment mm -hmm. has moved me to the it floor. It has, it has. Um, <laughs> that, so, when, when you have a wild animal, you know, we don't think, one, we don't think of ourselves as animals, right? We think of right, ourselves yeah. as people. It's like, you're an animal. One, we don't think of ourselves as animals in captivity, even though there are humans on this planet right now who live in a drastically different way, who have drastically different physical outcomes than we do. Mm -hmm. So if you are looking at a whale in SeaWorld and a whale in the wild, you would, you would kind of laugh, you know, when someone tried to make a broad statement about orcas in captivity and apply it to the whole orca kingdom that's out there because you know the difference you 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 can tell like that's not right that here's a tiny tank there are all these flags going that's not right that's captivity things are going to be different even if you can't articulate the difference of what they are um but we don't really see the same for ourselves because it's like being born in a tank an animal brought to SeaWorld or an animal put into a zoo mm -hmm. after being in the wild is going to have a much different experience yeah. than an animal even, born into it. Really quickly, you even talked about um, the fact that I think when they get put back in the water after being in captivity, their fin doesn't just adjust. You yeah, know? no, that, that phase was over, right? That, that was a, like, there's an, there's an alignment, mm -hmm. so to speak, between, um, the developmental process and the medium, the natural medium, right? There's, right? You have these genetically timed phases of your life. Mm -hmm. They've just always gone along with a particular medium. All we've changed is the habitat. The habitat, the habitat is really the problem. Your body, like this kind of droopy, like the, the droopy orca fin is not, it's not a failure of the fin. The fin is behaving, the orca is behaving, the genetic programming is behaving exactly as it can, given the medium. Like right. the, it's, the flopped over fin is exactly the outcome that you would expect, given the genetic code and the habitat. Right. So all of these problems that we have, these modern ailments, are the, they're, they're the equivalent, right? You've got flopped over spines, flopped arches, People have the organs falling out and falling down. Yeah. You've got friction, inflammation due to, to pressure. And, and I'm not even talking about the dietary. I'm, I'm strictly the mechanical. There are so many other ways we're kind of out of alignment, so yeah. to speak. Um, but mechanically speaking, our behavior, like our, our, our problems, they're not really problems. They are, they are the body behaving exactly as you would expect given the habitat. The habitat sucks. Yeah. The habitat needs to change. But in the same way that you can't take an animal raised in the wild, I'm sorry, raised in captivity and throw it into the wild, it doesn't have the skill set. So do you need this slow supplemental supplementation right. process to slowly build up missing strengths, missing the ability to process sensory information. Like right people can't even walk barefoot if they've been wearing shoes They're like, ah, oh, it hurts. I don't have it's like, <laughs> yeah, you don't have the thickness to the skin, literally. Um, yeah. your, that part of your body has never processed information. It's just always been in a little cushion, you know, in a little protective mm -hmm. box. So there's like a slow releasing of the parts, I guess, back to the wild. That is yeah. nutritious movement. Yeah. And I've seen this across the board when people, they get into the barefoot running phenomenon and they're just like, I'm just, I'm going all in. They're like mm -hmm. trashed mm -hmm. for like yeah. a month afterwards with like yeah. knee problems, neck problems. And, but at first it's just like, it's so freeing, but you have yeah. to understand that we are basically, we've put ourselves in this weird habitat, you know, this, it's very abnormal habitat. And, you know, talking about, especially with the orcas, you understand about the, the even every little microcurrent that's in the ocean that they would naturally mm -hmm. be in is affecting their, their anatomy, you know, and also just like the being, being able to, to go straight. You know, what sure. a concept and, and yeah. to change speeds, you know, right. all of these things change the load that determine what we look like. And so this brings me to asking you to talk about something important for all of us, which is underwear. <laughs> Katie, let's talk about underwear. <laughs> all right. Let's talk about the, uh, the bras. <laughs> right. In, in some people's case, you know, the, the bras and the underwear. Let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about this. Some of these things that we just 
automatically kind of take for granted that are creating certain loads on ourselves or, you know, unloading certain things and creating deformities. Well, like in the book, I just talk about um, like men's underwear and the effect of, I mean, basically you've got your testicles hanging there or not, right? You could have underwear that's holding everything up super tight and, and right. um, you know, you've got muscles that move. Is it better to call them balls or testicles? What would you call Either them? one. Let's go with balls. Let's right. go with balls. Why balls not? are just better. Um, you know, your balls are coming up and down based on right. the temperature, right? There's a, there's a wide variance of it. Like your balls cross train naturally. Right. They're like, it's hot. I'm going down away from the body. It's cold. I'm going up. So this muscle stays strong by moving your balls as it should based on the situation but underwear like boom the situation is you're wearing underwear and you're going to be up there tight no matter if you want to come down to so the muscles like hey, right. i got nothing to do anymore and then you get an atrophy of a muscle and then the circulation to the muscle goes down and and the the action of a muscle doesn't only accomplish the movement there are movements of blood to local areas around a muscle based mm -hmm. on the movement. So you don't just disable the muscle, you disable all of the other nutrient shuttling in and out, the circulation right. to the broader area right. that that was packaged for energy conservation purposes together, mm -hmm. right? You right. don't need a, well, why would your balls ever not be responding to the environment? So we'll just go ahead and keep the health of the other areas. Right. packaged up so that when your balls are busy doing what they're doing, it'll feed the surrounding areas. But now your balls don't do anything except sit there. That muscle doesn't do anything. And then therefore the whole, the whole um, mechanism, the whole packaged organic package relationship of how the body works gets messed with. And the same thing goes with bras, right? You've got muscles and suspensory ligaments that stay at a certain shape to support the weight of the breast, which fluctuates, right? You have kids or maybe not, but your, <laughs> your weight's coming up and coming down. You're sometimes you're just sitting there where your bra, where your breasts are creating a certain load. Sometimes you're running and that's a different load or you're walking fast or you're breastfeeding or whatever, that there's all these cross training that should be happening, but we just put on a bra, all of that effect goes away. And then you end up with a shape, not only to those organs or structures but to the supporting structure there's a tone there's a resting state to all of that just it's just what i call a cast right it's right. the same it's like the same thing i could be looking five miles away one mile away three feet away but i'm looking at different things all of the time and my eyes are constantly mm -hmm. doing all of this but not anymore i pretty much look at a screen or wow. i look at a wall so it's like the range of motion it's like doing a bicep curl but only giving someone two inches it's like you can do all the bicep curls you want but you can do them for two inches right your biceps are going to look a particular way when you're done. Your tendons are going to adapt. Your bone density is going to change because of this narrow range of use. So we've made everything. We've, we've just eliminated variability. And then for the patterns that we do use, we've made them like super small. Mm -hmm. So the state of your body, you, the shape of your body right now compared to the shape of your body in nature is radically different. Like it's, it's so different. Same, same genetic code the adaptations are going to be radically different. And so there's just these things that we've all been bequeathed, you know, like you give your kid a pillow. Why wouldn't you give a kid a pillow? Everyone has a pillow when they sleep. They get a mattress. Why wouldn't you get a mattress? Everyone gets a mattress when they sleep. And slowly people are just casted by these culturally assumed items, shoes, um, temperature control. Oh, you're cold. You just bundle up, right? So the trillion of muscles, the erector pili that live on your skin never move because they don't have to regulate your temperature anymore. Yeah, you that's so... You put on a device to right. do that, you know? It goes on and on. Yeah, it we does. we become very domesticated, yeah. you know? Like, that's we're that's we're right. not we're not ourselves, you know? And there's these small things. And for, for many years, you know, I proactively... And me and you were probably in the same boat for sure early on where when you were the Bally's trainer of the year and where yeah. I was, like, going for that exercise to try to balance out all of my sedentary behavior. You know, and then I, eventually, of course, I woke up to that and, and started to incorporate much more movement into my day and not just sitting, computer, yeah. exercise, you know, because I'm doing better than most of the population, you know, and we're setting the bar really low for ourselves, you know, yeah. and I love the example of, especially with our vision, you know, and understanding that if we're continuously looking at a computer screen and not being able to look off in the distance, we're putting a cast on our on our eyes, on our lens. 
in our eyes. And it's really, really profound because that can eventually, you're doing that over and over and over and again, and not just necessarily looking at a computer. Maybe it's just like, you know, you're a bookworm, like you said, and most of your vision is here at something that's really close to you. Then you start to see, you know, quote, nearsightedness, you know, and other conditions show up that, oh, it's because of this, it's because of that. But it's really something that we've tra entrained our bodies to do. And with the the whole concept we had on, uh, it was it was probably about a year or so ago, one of our earlier shows, uh, Sidney Ross Singer, and he wrote a wonderful book called Dress to Kill. And he really talks about, you know, a lot of the even um, Harvard-based research on the potential problems of wearing bras all the time, you know, and the fear that's associated with not wearing bras. Sure. So there's a lot of stuff for us to, to kind of unwind and understand like a lot of stuff, a lot of this stuff, you know, most of us, and just, let's just be real about it. A lot of us are never actually naked unless we're showering or having sex. And for some people, not even when they have sex. You know, like, I'm going to keep these socks on. I don't want you to see the hammer time or whatever. Or, you know, some some women, like, they um, all the time they keep their bra on for whatever uh, reason, you know, what's going on in their mind and their programming as well. You know, so a lot of times people aren't getting naked except for those things. And all of those loads that we would be experiencing if we were more free, you know, and I'm not saying to everybody take off their clothes and go running around. I'm not saying that right now. But it's just something to consider and like looking at things that we can do to start to counter, counterbalance some of this stuff. And this is really where I want the conversation to go now to start talking about some solutions yeah. to this problem that we have from kind of being restricted and put a cast on ourselves unknowingly. So what are some of the daily practices or things that we can get, get an eye on to start doing to move our DNA? Um, well, I guess if, if everyone just wanted to take one step, I would say that transitioning to a minimal shoe is probably one of the best things you can do for your whole body because shoes shoes are going to affect they don't just affect the foot you put one on you put something on every day it does once you transition like you have to do a little bit of corrective exercise work to be able to do that but once you do that you are now going to change your whole body geometry by what you just choose to put on your foot in the morning like there's no extra time involved where walking you would have to go out and do something so once you just swap some of those things in your um, closet. After, if you can transition to minimal shoes, um, then just start walking more. It does not have to be all at once. So if you're like, there's no way I can walk five to 10 miles a day, I don't have the time. You can probably fit three or four 10 minute walks into your day. Like if you just get up and the first thing in the morning, just walk around your block twice. Like it doesn't have to be anything big. Just start figuring out where you can just take more walk so I was you know like the old information of like park farther away from wherever you're going but the second one is tr see if there's any places you can drive is there a place that you drive to like a few times a week that you really could walk to if you wanted to like mm. like I can always walk to my sister's house it's not always convenient to do it but I always can it's like a half a mile um the, the post office is close within a mile and so I've just set parameters for a few places I'm going I will never drive to these places that's just the rule the rule is you always walk to these places mm, um yeah. that all being said I'm a very so I'm a very busy person like I work a ton yeah I save up my work phone calls for these walks so it's like okay I'm gonna go walk to do it but I'm also gonna take all my work calls outside so I do a lot of interviews outside this one I have to be still <clears throat> although I will say that I'm sitting on the ground and switching positions so mm -hmm. that's already different than sitting and standing in place yeah. Um, so walk more frequently, mm -hmm. not just more distance, but try to walk more frequently throughout the day and throughout the week. Um, squat toilet. Do you guys do like the squatty potty squatty stuff? Squatty potty. Yeah. We did a whole show on that one. Yeah. yeah so absolutely. just like you're already sitting there. It doesn't take any more time. Put your feet up on something. If you don't have a squatty yeah. potty, just go get two waste paper baskets and flip them over get a box. You don't even have to be doing a squat. You could just change your joint configuration passively by putting yeah. your feet up on something better, better for your whole body, whole elimination alignment. Um, go outside. So those loads, vision is one of them, but also temperature. Let yourself be a little cold sometimes or a little mm -hmm. warm. Like don't always try to modify the environment so that you're comfortable. Yeah. 
learn to be comfortable in different yes. environments. It doesn't mean you have to be out there freezing nude. Yeah. Just like if you usually put on seven jackets and a hat and a scarf, <laughs> maybe go out without the hat or the scarf or take off a jacket or like let your body regulate your temperature. That expends calories. Like yeah. that is like thermal regulation is a task. It's a, it's a muscular task that you're yeah. missing out on. Um, oh, really? Else? I want to add something in really quickly there. Yeah, and yeah. this this also leads to micro functions. These macro things lead to micro functions. So that b ability to adapt with temperatures helps your immune system to be able to adapt to certain things you're exposed to. You know, like if you're sure. constantly in this one area with your temperature, and I know people like this, close people, they're quick to, you know, turn on the heat or turn on the air condition as soon as they feel just a little bit uncomfortable. You know, it's just like, just chill, let your body adapt. It's not that big of a deal because when you do that, you stop noticing like there's such a big variance because your body is, is more adapted. And also, again, this can help to really keep your immune system in tip top shape. And one of the things that we've talked about as well is the cold thermogenesis and just exposing yourself to cold and how that really helps to fortify and enhance immune system function. So definitely, I'm a huge fan of what you just said. Well, immunity is movement, your whole immune right, system. Yeah is gravity dependent, right? So, so astronauts true. have a trouble with immunity. So like astronauts, like in the same way that nutrition really came about from uh, people in prisons and people on sailboats, right? Like people, like little yeah. pockets of small people who lived and ate in a different way. That's where we figured out things like vitamin C and scurvy came from these populations. Astronauts give us a big insight to, wow, this isn't a disease. This is a gravity problem. Your relationship with gravity is off and your relationship with gravity changes through movement. And so immunity is movement. So all of these, you know, you don't think of the hairs lifting up to trap heat to keep you warm as a workout, but it is, it's a trillion muscle workout that burns quite a lot of energy. You just gotta, you gotta let your body respond. You know, the, the problem with not really recognizing the difference between exercise and movement is that our whole way of comprehending Movement. When I say movement, almost everyone's thinking exercise, right? They're like, right, oh, I got to change my workout, yeah. you know, and I'm, I'm not really, whatever you do for your workout is fine. Like I'm talking about all of the other stuff, all of the other ways that you have a limited, you, you've outsourced all of your movement. Every single little movement you can do down to the tiny little hair lifts, you've outsourced to some sort of technology, clothing, yeah. heater, air conditioner, the walls of your house, your shoes, glasses, the, like, you, the couch, you know, you're resting against the back. Like, it's all been outsourced. And to reclaim it, you know, like the difference between not exercising and exercising. You get an exercise high kind of, right, mm -hmm. you know, that we talk about. But it's like saying that someone who's been like slightly smothered gets a high when we let them out. Like it's like yeah. we're going to kind of smother you. And that's like I feel amazing because I'm finally taking a deep breath. Like right. we've gotten so – hung up on the exercise high that we forget the reason we have that exercise high is because we're smothering ourselves right. almost all of the other time. So stop smothering yourself. Yeah. And then you get that exercise high will go away. You'll just feel like that all of the time. Right. What a concept. That's not motivation. Like, right? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. And one other, I want to throw one other thing in there is, uh, and this is something I conscientiously had to do because I would always throw on some quote house shoes you know, yeah, yeah. and I still, shoes. yeah, I know. Right. I remember <laughs> sure. when I was a kid, you know, my grandmother, and my grandfather, they got me these little like moccasins. They look like some stuff from, you know, Davy Crockett or something. I don't know, but they were the coolest thing, but they were made of like leather and like, they were really this fantastic material, but those days were long gone. They've evolved to, you know, like basically sandals, you know, like, um, I, the kids call them slides. So like, you know, some Nike slides, but, um, Another thing I want to throw out there is just proactively, when you get home, take off your shoes. Take off your shoes. Go barefoot. Take off, you know, your socks so your feet can actually get the sensation of the ground again. You know, and also, of course, taking that outside and you get the added benefit of grounding, you know, which sure. we're definitely, we're going to do a whole show talking about that. We've mentioned many times in the show. But there's just these small things that you can do that don't take a lot of effort to start to change the way your body is, is, is forming itself because it's always doing that. So, Katie, every episode when I have an awesome guest like yourself, I have this question that I like to ask, and I'm very curious to hear your answer. So, what is the model that you're here to set with the way that you're living your life personally? The model, well, 
I don't recommend anything that I don't do myself. So I try to model an authentic representation of prioritizing your life to transitioning back, or to transition away from a sedentary life and towards a very dynamic, biologically sustainable life, not just for me, but for our entire species. Like this is a species issue. And that's what I'm here to do is, is to model for the species, I guess. Yes. Oh, I love with that. my children. <laughs> yes. So good. So good. Well, Katie, can you let everybody know where they can get connected with you and also where they can find Move Your DNA? Um, you can find me at Katie Says, K A T Y Says dot com. Um, and you can find Move Your DNA. You can find your Move Your DNA at a bookstore or you can buy it online. And. Our main re website is restorativeexercise.com, soon to be nutritiousmovement.com. Ah, I love it. I love the name change, too. I'm all about that nutritious movement. I've been talking about it on previous shows. So everybody, definitely head over and check Katie out and definitely get your hands on Move Your DNA. I think it, you know, the word I used earlier is a critical book to have in our world today, for sure. And I just want to thank you, Katie. You're amazing. I know that it's taken a lot of just mulling over stuff and thinking about things and changing the way that your brain ap actually operates. And now you can see stuff so clearly, but I know it took a lot of work up front to help to create the person you are. So I just want to give you some huge props. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's my honor. And everybody, I appreciate you so much as well. Make sure to take action on some of these things, you know, start to re-examine how we might've unknowingly put ourselves in a cast, you know, maybe it's, staring at your computer screen for far too long each day. Maybe you could just take a little bit of time, maybe every 20 minutes and just look off, go, look, go look out a window, you know, and just change that exposure that you're giving yourselves, you know. Also, taking those breaks each day because research indicates it's not how long of a break you take, it's how frequently you take breaks and getting up and moving around. There's so much that you can add to the table. And this is just a slice of the pie. There's so much more in Move Your DNA and there's so much more to come on the Model Health Show. So. Take care, have an amazing day, and I'll talk with you soon.